In 2003, a woman called Elizabeth Holmes dropped out of Stanford University where she was studying chemical engineering and she started up a company called Theranos. Instead of having to draw blood out of your vein with a big needle, you could just prick your thumb, take a couple of drops of blood. And in theory, they were going to be able to run like 200 blood tests on these couple of drops. The problem is the technology didn't work, but they didn't have the humility to come out and admit that the technology wasn't working, to scale back, to take it step by step. Instead, what they did was they lied. They lied to their investors, to their employees, to their clients. They bullied their staff. They, uh, they were very secretive. They made people sign non-disclosures on joining and then on leaving. They sued anyone who talked about anything. And this medical product, which was almost uh, a guess at what the correct blood reading should be, was actually being used by patients at one point in very limited cases, but it was being used by patients and giving the wrong results. It's really hard to say what went wrong at Theranos in the sense that um, even having read the book twice now, I'm not clear on whether Elizabeth Holmes was just a fantasist. She wanted to believe the technology would work eventually, and so she just gave it everything she'd got, and she just kept plowing on in the hope that someday she would be proven right, or whether she was a liar and did not listen to the people around her who had the expertise that she lacked. It could also be that shortcut mentality that any barrier that's in your way is somehow a fake barrier. Some barriers are there for good reasons. We have regulations on, on testing of blood for a reason. Um, in the States they do, here in, in Britain we do. We have, we have rules for a reason to stop patients from being harmed by getting tests, results that tell them they're sick when they're not or that they're not sick when they are. And she didn't seem to care about any of that. She didn't seem to understand the concept of medical ethics. And if she did understand the, context, the concept, she didn't seem to want to do anything about it. She didn't seem to care about sticking to those medical ethics. So there are a whole bunch of things that went wrong whether that was out of badness, or whether it was out of incompetence, or whether it was a combination of the two, I don't really know. Another issue with the Theranos scandal was that people were so afraid of missing out on this so-called great investment opportunity that they stuck around rather than just walking away. Now, part of this was a cult of personality issue. Apparently, Elizabeth Holmes was so personable, charismatic, plausible, credible, whatever word you want to use, that people would just sort of flock to her and be inspired by her. And that was a big part of the mystique of the company. So, so people definitely wanted to work with her. But clients, for instance, even though she was missing deadline after deadline after deadline, clients would still not walk away which meant they had more and more to protect which, in terms of their own reputation, which means that they lost all the more in the end. There was, however, an incredibly high turnover of staff. So that the people who would come and work for Theranos, they would very quickly realize that this was a bad place, bad technology, bad management, and they would leave. So you did have some people leaving in that regard, but they weren't able to, to warn anyone because they'd signed all these non-disclosure agreements. One of the, the most disturbing things is that Theranos did have some very good people working for it. The problem was, as far as I can tell, these people were not allowed to do their jobs. They had all this expertise, but whenever it came to does Elizabeth win or does this other person win in terms of the argument? It seemed like Elizabeth always won regardless of the fact that she didn't have the expertise of the other people. And also because of this cult of personality issue I mentioned earlier, 
I think there was a bit of a downward spiral. So what happens is this, you have someone who doesn't listen to their experts. So what happens with experts who are not listened to? They tend to just go away, right? They don't want to be there anymore. So they leave and who takes their places? Often it's, it's yes men, you know, people who just want to say anything the boss wants to hear because hell, if the boss isn't going to listen to them anyway, isn't going to pay attention, they might as well just say what's going to get them the promotion, get them the, the, the ear of the boss. So I think that was the start of a, a bad cycle of, of she just became surrounded by people who did not know what they're talking about, did not care that they did not know what they were talking about. And that just made everything so much worse. If the investors and her very senior board of advisors, which included bigwigs like George Schultz, uh, former Secretary of State, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense, Mad Dog Mattis, all of these people, if they had just asked some basic questions about how do we do these blood tests now? Why does it work that way? Why do we need so much blood? What kind of blood tests are there anyway out of these 200 tests? There were a couple of uh, auto blood test systems on the market that would do maybe 10 or 15 blood tests at once. So how did they work and what were the problems that they had and why had they never gotten beyond their 10 or 15 blood tests? Why did they never get to 200? Was it because they were stupid, they were idiots? Or was it perhaps that there were more fundamental problems with going down that path and they'd gone as far as they could doing it carefully and rationally and all that? In the first chapter of the book, I talk a lot about what it takes for technology to succeed in a particular application. Now, the first problem was there was no technology here. This was a problem that had been recognized and an idea for what a solution could look like, almost a set of criteria of what we're trying to achieve, but there was no actual technology that was there to achieve that. So I think if anyone had looked at the first chapter of the book where it's talking about what can the technology do, what features does it have, you know, to work in the application or not, people would have immediately said, but wait a minute, there is no technology. There is nothing here. Also, questions related to what is it exactly that we want this thing to do? Why is it an advantage? What are the circumstances in which the thing is going to be used? What does that mean in terms of the temperature it's going to have to sit at? How fast is it going to have to work? Is it really possible with a couple of drops of blood to get a sensible uh, reading on some of these tests? With some of them, it's yes or no. You get a yes or no answer. So if there's any of that particular chemical in the blood, then, then that's fine. But with some of them, it's like counting. So we all know that statistically, the smaller the, the sample you have to work with, the less reliable the count you're going to get of, say, how many red blood cells, how many white blood cells, that kind of thing. So I think if anyone had seriously started asking questions here, they would very quickly have come to the conclusion that there was no serious technology, that the, the questions were not being addressed properly, and they should stay well clear. And incidentally, there were some venture capitalists who did ask the right questions. I don't know what their process was, but they did steer well clear. And those were anyone who was actually cognizant of the way medical technology works. Hi, I'm Sunny Baines, author of Explaining the Future. If you're interested in more tips on how to research, analyze, and report on emerging technologies, please look out for more of my videos or check out explainingthefuture.org.